Welcome to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Raban. And what is today's show about? Today's show is about, I, I don't even know what to call it. We've been talking about what to call it. But essentially, it's something to the effect of, as a patient, often you guys don't know the differences between the various techniques of the same thing. Let me explain. All procedures are not created equally. So someone gets a haircut and another person gets a haircut, right? So they both got haircuts. One haircut took two and a half hours. It was multiple layers using shears. And it was a, a, a high-end stylus. Another one used a clipper and buzzed off someone's hair. Technically, they're both haircuts. But I would argue, as with the results, that they're completely different. The problem is that you guys, as patients, go and get, let's say, a lower eyelid surgery done. And you don't really know what are the little areas where, I don't want to say, well, actually, I will where doctors may take a shortcut or may not do the more difficult way of doing it, even though it gives a better result. So like most things that are procedural, often there are little things that you can choose to do or not to do, and they're usually more difficult to do as a surgeon that will lead to a better result, but you don't have the time, the skill, or the energy to do it, so you just don't do it. And as a result, the result isn't as good Yet the patient would never know because as far as they're concerned, they got a haircut. So let me dive in here and give you a little bit of a highlight. I'm going to break it up today into two parts, meaning the face and then the body. And we'll discuss sort of the areas in each surgery that I think you as a patient need to make sure you ask your surgeon, hey, these are very quick little highlights and Hopefully at the end, if you're thinking of one of these procedures and you're going to a doctor, you can say the specific, uh, particular buzzwords and see what their responses are. Because I think that these small items make a big difference. All right, so let's start with a very easy one, my favorite. Let's start with the rhinoplast. So as I've mentioned on numerous occasions, a nose job, forget about if it's done open or closed, has two basic methodologies. The traditional old school approach, which is done daily, which is reductive, which means I have a big nose, big hump, big tip, it's droopy, it's wide, and I go into a doctor and I ask that doctor to make it smaller, hence reducing its overall size. When I do that, I ask the doctor to make the nose more refined. A traditional approach is, re is about removing things, bone, cartilage, connective tissue, etc., so when that doctor using that technique is done, the nose is, yes, smaller, as requested. However, it is also weaker, and it is weaker in some really critical areas. And if you look at celebrities, people like Bella Hadid and other individuals who'd had their noses done and watched their transformation, you'll start to notice the nose is starting to collapse. That's right, the word collapse, because the areas that you made refined you weakened, and the nose is a structure, and structures you weaken tend to settle. So modern-day rhinoplasty is reconstructive in that it uses structural grafts, meaning pieces of cartilage, to reinforce the areas that you made smaller and are now weaker. Naturally, you're taking your own cartilage, usually from the septum, and you reinforce and you support the nose so that while it is now refined and cued and pretty, in five years and 10 years and 20 years, the nose continues to have structure and integrity. So here is an example that if you go to your doctor and say, I want a rhinoplasty, the question you need to ask is, do you use cartilage grafts to support my nose or not? That's the key question. All right, let's talk lower eyelids. Very, very tricky surgery. Upper eyelids, on the other hand, not so tricky, pretty straightforward, kind of hard to mess it up, kind of like it's hard to mess up a hamburger. I mean, most hamburgers taste pretty good. Very hard to make some things like a souffle or other things. So lower eyelids, the key is there are two types of main lower eyelids, the kind where you're young, you don't have a lot of loose skin, and all you have is puffiness. That's called the transconj lower bleph. Transconj, meaning through the conjunctiva, that's the inside of your eyelid, lower blepharoplasty. And then there are older type patients who have puffy eyes, plus they have loose skin. 
And in those instances, many times we go from underneath the eyelid itself. Now, what do you need to know? Where are the shortcuts? If you do a transconch lower bleph, meaning go through the eyelid, you're a young person with puffy eyes, the easy route is to go in there and remove the fat. Just remove it. It's puffy. Just get rid of it. And what will happen? You will come out of surgery and your puffiness will be gone. Fantastic. What will also happen? Your lower eyes will look more hollow. That is correct. You have now removed the puffiness. But what you didn't realize is that there is no volume under your eyes. And often patients who have a traditional lower eyelid fat removal are left with hollow looking eyes. A more modern and sophisticated approach to the lower eyelid is something called transconjular bleph, same, with fat repositioning, which means what you do is rather than going in there removing all that fat, some of that fat you take and instead of removing it, you move it and push it into the hollow because everyone who has a puffy eye also has a hollow in front of it. That's called a tear trough. There are two issues puffiness, tear trough. So when you get rid of the puffiness, all you have is a really big tear trough. With this more sophisticated technique, it's called translocation. You're taking the fat and remove instead of removing it, you're actually using it to fill the hollowness in front of it. Super sophisticated and spectacular surgery. But like all these surgeries I'm going to be mentioning to you, it requires skill. So what do you ask your doctor? Hey, you're doing a lower bleph. Are you repositioning my fat? That's the question you want to ask. Then we go to the other type of eyelid. You're cutting underneath the eyelid and you are removing skin. What is that a setup for? It's a setup for something called ectropion. That's fancy for eyelid getting pulled down. There are hundreds of celebrities who get their lower eyelids done and ruin their careers because after they get their lower eyelids done, they got the sort of droopy eyelid pulled down look on the corner of their eye and you can see the white of their eyes. That's because the scar tissue occurs. If you notice, the lower eyelid is fairly mobile and wobbly. And as the scar tissue forms, it pulls the eyelid down. Horrible complication. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to do the surgery and in addition, do some type of supportive procedure to support and strengthen the lower eyelid so it resists the pulling down. There are many type procedures. All you do need to do is ask your surgeon, hey, if you're going to be removing skin, what are you doing to support my lower eyelid from getting pulled down? That's also really, really important. All right, let's shift gears to facelifts. There are hundreds of different types of facelifts. All of them are all different names because every surgeon is trying to name the facelift after him or herself. But what you need to understand is there are two types of facelifts. There is what's called a skin only and a skin muscle surgery. So a skin only facelift is where your doctor goes, lifts up your skin, does some separating, and then pulls on your skin. The end. And there are some really rare cases where that is okay, but in most patients who have a jowl and their nasolabial folds are hanging and they have a marionette and all those things that we hate when we get into our early 50s, they need their muscles to be elevated. So if you're going to go get a facelift, the correct way, in my opinion, or the long and painful way for the surgeon, hence why they avoid it. Notice all the things I'm mentioning are happening because patient surgeons want the quick, easy, and skill-less procedure. What they do is, the right thing to do is lift up the skin, identify the muscle layer, it's called the SMAS, S-M-A-S, -S, SMAS layer, and do something with it, either lift it and suture it, Remove a little of it in suture, but you have to lift the muscles and put them back into a better location if you really want to get an amazing result of your facelift. And so because your facial nerves are under there, surgeons want to avoid it because it's tricky and risky and therefore not something they want to dabble with. But I don't think the results will be excellent. 
So what do you need to ask your surgeon? Hey, what type of facelift are you doing? Are you doing a skin only facelift? Or are you doing a dual plane, two planes, skin and muscle, or skin and muscle type facelift? That's really, really important. The last thing on my sort of face things are chin ox. Um, I love chin ox. It's really, really one of my favorite procedures because it makes a serious, serious improvement. So when you do a chin og, one of the big questions is, hey, doctor, what size are you going to use? I don't want the Jay Leno size. I don't want my chin to look ridiculous. And they say, don't worry, you won't. And then so the question is, how the hell do they know what size to pick? Small, medium, large, extra large? What type of shape should they pick? Because there's different shapes. Oh, don't worry, I have experience. So I think that's hogwash. The way it's supposed to be done, and the reason it's supposed to be done that way is because the company makes the right thing for it is using sizers. Meaning the doctor uses temporary implants, inserts them into the pocket during your surgery, looks at the different shapes and different sizes, decides at that moment which one looks best in your face, and then opens that implant and inserts it, as opposed to what's normally done, which is before surgery, your doctor will have decided you're a MPJC, that's a type of implant, size medium. You may or may not be, it may have been, may or may not be the right size, it may or may not be the right shape, but at that point, you're you're pretty much shit out of luck, because that's what they have selected, and that's what's in the operating room. When I operate, I have all the implants present. That way, I am not beholden to any size that I had ordered in advance. So what you want to ask your chin og surgeon is, hey, do you have all the implants and sizes present at the time of my surgery so that you can decide what's best during surgery rather than in advance? All right, let's take a quick break. Those were just some of the sort of highlights or pet peeves of mine that people, doctors would tell them they did a chin og or blepharoplasty and make it sound like all surgeries are created equally. We'll take a quick break and then we'll head back and shift gears to the body as there are similar type things that I think you need to know before you embark on any body surgery. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the second half of Plastic Surgery at Sensor as I am giving you some tips some things to ask your surgeons as you're doing some surgeries because I think there are some shortcuts. And I don't like shortcuts because shortcuts are usually need lesser great results. So let's shift gears and talk about breast augmentation. I think there's a ton of shortcuts in breast augmentation. So what are those shortcuts? Number one is that you want to ask your surgeon how long the surgery is going to take because usually surgery that's done super quick ends up having bad results. There is no correlation between quick and good. Anything that's handmade, a mural, a carpet, a painting, a, soup, a, 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 a turkey dinner, the longer it takes, the better it is. There's just no question about that. So if someone's surgeon's bragging about how they do your breast augmentation in 30 minutes flat, I would get up, walk out the door, and go to another office. Now, Taking forever is not ideal, but you shouldn't be flying through it. And breast dogs are one of those cases that doctors love, love to do quickly and get the hell out. Why? Because they have like five of them or six of them that day, and they just need to knock them out and be done with it. So ask them how long the surgery is going to take. The next thing is ask them, do you use sizers? Again, like the chin hog, how do you know what size I should be, doctor? Oh, I've done this a very long time. Here, use these implants in the office to put in your bra and you decide if you want to be a 300 or 325. You know what? Let's use a computer model to figure out what size you should be. All of this is nonsense. The reason why they do all this crap before surgery is because they don't want to waste time during surgery to actually put the implant in and see which is more accurate. You wearing an implant through your clothes in a bra or me inserting an implant and sitting you up. So surgeons that do accurate breast dogs have all the implants available. It's called a consignment. I have a closet. In that closet is, I don't know, 
$150,000 worth of implants. And then I have sizers. Sizers are the exact copy of that implant. That's right. I have an extra copy. So I make pockets. I insert the size I think you need to be. And then I sit you up. That's right. You need to ask your surgeon, are you trying me with sizers and sitting me up to confirm the size? Or are you just popping them in and we call it a day? Because that process of trying sizers means that I have to have the, all the implants and it means that I need to take time to sit you up. So you want to make sure you ask your surgeon, are you sitting me up multiple times and are you using sizers before you select my implant? The last thing is if you're using a silicone implant, right? If any of you have seen a silicone implant, it's a pre-filled implant. It's not a saline implant where you, it's a tiny little implant that you roll in and then you fill it up with water when it's inside your body. This thing comes as a pre-filled ball. And if you've looked at uh, the incision for a breast dog, it doesn't matter where the incision is, areola, in the crease, armpit, wherever. It's small. Have you ever wondered how the hell you get that huge implant in that tiny little space? And the answer is we shove it in there. That's right. We take the implant, open it out of the box. It was sterile. And then we shove it into your body through a tiny little hole. Obviously, that is not ideal. It's not ideal for the implant. It's not ideal for your tissue. It's just all around a shitty option. There was a guy. His name was Miss Dr. Keller. He came up with a device called the Keller Funnel. Wow, wow, wow. What a major advancement in breast implant surgery. Essentially, you take the implant. You don't touch it with your fingers. You put it in this funnel, like a cake funnel. And then you just shove it straight into the pocket and it never touches anything and goes in atraumatically. I mean, holy shit, what a major advancement. Well, then the, the question is, wouldn't all surgeons use it? And the answer is no, because the Keller funnel costs money. And what we're trying to do with surgery is do the surgery the cheapest way possible to save money. So you want to ask your doctor, point blank, are you using a Keller funnel? Because it's a one-time device, meaning... It's only opened and used for you, and we can't re-sterilize it and use it for another patient, so it goes in the trash. A lot of doctors who do high-volume breast dogs are not going to burn money on a, on a funnel when they could shove the implant in for free. So, ask about uh, the funnel. All right, now we're moving into some more fun stuff. Breast lifts, breast reductions. So, the question is the following. Ask your doctor, are you sitting me up and sitting me down multiple times or are you just, you know, kind of sit you up, make a cool decision and sit you back down? When I do a breast lift or a breast reduction, it takes me, on average, four damn long hours. Four hours, a long time. Because I have to sit you up and sit you down and sit you up and sit you down. Notice the key here. The key is that you and I look at your breast standing up, standing up in the office and decide if it looks good or not. We never look at your breast laying down and say, wow, they look gorgeous. So when we operate on you, we operate on you laying down. So the only way for us as surgeons to know for even in the ballpark of what it's going to look like is to sit you up because it looks totally different sitting you down and sitting you up. So obviously, if you want to be accurate, I sit you up like, 10 times. And so the question you want to ask is, are you sitting me up? And if so, how often? Because at the end of the day, that's super critical. Then comes the most important part of these body surgeries, which is closure. Are you doing a handful of stitches or are you doing a ton of stitches? What's the difference? Anything that requires closure. C-section, gallbladder, tummy tuck, breast reduction. All these things require closure. The goal is for them to heal beautifully. How are you going to make them heal beautifully? It requires a lot of closing. You want to reduce the tension. So it takes time. And part of that four hours is not just sitting you up and sitting down. It's just meticulous, layered closure. And I hate doing it because it's time consuming. So what you want to do is you want to ask your doctor specifically, point blank, are you or is someone else 
closing me. And when they stutter, well, uh, it's, it's very straightforward. The answer is I'm closing you, and only me or other people. And so when other people are closing you and he or she is doing it quickly, then the answer is you cannot expect your scar to be outstanding or at the very least you should know about it and not be surprised. I can tell you how many times surgeons go into a breast reduction in like two and a half hours and get the hell out and then patients are complaining how the anchor scar is so terrible and I have keloids. It's really that simple. So it doesn't matter if it's a breast reduction and it doesn't matter if it's a breast lift. It requires time of sitting you up and sitting you down and a meticulous layered closure. So that shouldn't surprise you when we shift gears to tummy tucks. It's the same goddamn thing. It's the same thing because at the end of the day, we are concerned about closure. So we want to make sure that the doctor himself or herself is the only one doing it. The only way to know that is to eyeball them and tell them, hey, are you closing or do you have anybody else who's helping you? Because really there's no reason for anyone else to be closing you. I don't care. The only reason to do is because I get tired. That's the bottom line. So that's really, really important in tummy tucks. The next thing that's important is that there isn't too much tension. Too much tension. So when they close you super tight, you end up being super tight. The scar ends up being thick. And when it's thick, it ends up being ugly and it also ends up raising up high. And you don't want to make, sh you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Lastly is the idea of hernias and hernia repairs. You want to make sure that there are no meshes used. I have never done a tummy tuck in 20 years and repaired a hernia using any mesh because these are almost always correctable using your own muscle. So that is super important when it comes to body, breast and body. The last one is the weight loss patients. So these are easy. Mommy makeovers and breasts and things are straightforward. What if I lost 150 pounds? What if I lost 90 pounds and I have sagging arms, sagging thighs, my breasts are sagging, my abdomen and trunk is sagging? Those patients are the highest at risk for tag teaming. What tag teaming means is that, listen, I'm going to bring in a whole bunch of people and we're going to divvy it up. I'll close your right arm. Another doctor will close your left arm and two people will be working on your thigh simultaneously. The only advantage of that is that you get to do multiple surgeries at once and theoretically get out. The disadvantage to that is that you have four random ass people operating on you and I'm almost certain you don't know about it. So notice how I keep reiterating shortcuts. These are the shortcuts that the people take, and it's really, really important that you know about them. Lastly, the shortcuts are also associated with the facility, making sure that they use accredited facilities, making sure that the anesthesia providers are people they work with on a regular basis. So what happens with the anesthesia providers, I've been working with two anesthesiologists for almost 18 years. That means I know them inside and out and only on super rare instances, they're not there. Many surgeons just use whoever is the anesthesiologist that the surgery center has selected for them that day. And often they're meeting the anesthesiologist for the first time with you or have seldom ever worked with this anesthesiologist. For me, that's unsettling, at least as the surgeon because I don't like working with anesthesiologists who I've never met before because I don't know if they're any good. Some make you chip your teeth. Some may make you gag. Some will make you nauseous. So you want to ask your surgeon, who's my anesthesiologist? And how many times have you worked with them in, in the past? And do you know them well? Because the truth is that many just rely on the facility to hire the anesthesiologist on your behalf. Now, Hopefully, some of these quick little tips will help you kind of guide you in the dialogue and know what to ask. We will have other shows where we will dive even deeper into each of these surgeries. But for the time being, I wanted to just make a quick and dirty guide of, if I, if you will, sort of semi-shortcuts or concerns for you to be paying attention to. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. As always, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed our show. 
you know what I ask at the end of every show, which is two things. One, if you love our show, share it with the people you care about. You never know when you'll find out that your cousin went and had a surgery done and they had a terrible outcome and you wish you had sent them one of our episodes. So send it to them. Secondly, if you love our show and you find it to be, I don't know, helpful, entertaining, whatever, go write something nice. Leave us a good message. We love positive reviews. It keeps the whole team, everyone who's doing this for you guys, uh, keeps us all going. All right. That wraps up, up yet another show. Until next time. Signing off, your host, Dr. Roddy Raban on Plastic Surgery Uncensored.